1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, and though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. Fornication and pride is the title of our Sunday school message taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 1 to 3. The Apostle Paul pointed out that there is gross immorality that is tolerated in the Corinthian church. Fornication, sexual immorality in the sight of God is likened to idolatry. There is a man within the congregation that laid with his father's wife, that is his stepmother, and this sin has not been dealt with. The offender continues to live in sin. Moral purity, Paul reminded them, is what brings glory and honour to God. The exercise of great spiritual gifts without moral purity is a mockery. We serve God in holiness. We serve God in holiness. This is true worship and service. Sin must be repented of and the offender disciplined. In their pride, the Corinthian church has allowed such immorality to cripple God's witness. He urged them to be awakened to their folly and mourn for the sin that is in the camp. He asked them to deal with it. When Achan took the accursed thing in the conquest of Ai, during Joshua's time, Israel suffered great defeat. God instructed Joshua to find the culprit, to be identified and to be dealt with. And so they had to do so tribe by tribe and from the tribe to the family and to identify finally the family of Achan. It was only after the accursed thing was removed that God began to give Israel victory over their enemies in their conquests of the promised land. If we allow sin in our lives to fester and we do not deal with sin, then we will not please God whatever service we would do would be only a false facade and front. May God be merciful to preserve the purity of His church through the purging of sin. Dealing with sin, the Apostle Paul said, the church that does not deal with sin but allows sin to fester would taint and compromise the testimony of Christ in his body. The church consists of God's people called out from the world unto holiness with God. So when the church allows the world and its filth into the church, it loses its divine power. The purpose of dealing with sin is to help the errant believer come back to God. So it is not destructive. Uh, discipline is not 
destructive, but rather is restorative, as uh, Zodiatist, Spiros Zodiatist, the Greek uh, commentator, warns. Telling the truth is the Christian's duty, but it becomes a sin when the motive is wrong. If it is not spoken in love, truth is not an implement for corrective surgery, but the weapon for killing the patient. What an insight, isn't it? The church, in their refusal to deal with the errant believer, suggests a general condition of spiritual sickness. Such a one ought to have been admonished and disciplined. The Apostle Paul has to write to awaken them out of their spiritual pride and that evil might be kept out of the church. May God preserve His church and may God preserve the purity of His people. For verily, Paul says, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. The Apostle Paul is deeply concerned about the toleration of sin within the church in Corinth and he's urging the leadership of the church to take the step to discipline this errant brother. He tells them his assessment of this man's spiritual state as though he was present with them. This man needs to be disciplined so that there is a restored order in the church and intolerance for sin to fester. Here, you would see the Apostle Paul, though he was not there in person, but he understood that when man is allowed to go on in their sin and their sin is not confessed and not repented of, it can cause great damage. It can cause great uh, retard, retardation to the cause of God. So he highlights their state of indifference towards sin. The evil nature of the sin seemed to be downplayed downplayed. And this is a problem, isn't it? In our world today, things are downplayed so that we just sweep it under the carpet, don't mention it. It will certainly affect the church witness. In the Gentile world, such sin of laying with one's father is certainly not tolerated. What more in the church? He certainly would not be involved with this had the Corinthian church been forthcoming in dealing with such a sin. He didn't have to mention it at all if it has been dealt with. But because it was not being dealt with, so there is a general state of coldness toward a life of holiness. It may be the tip of an iceberg. You know, uh, an iceberg uh, looks just a little bit on its surface, right? Doesn't look that frightening. It's just a, a little bit coming out of the surface. You can see a little bit there. But underneath, uh, underneath, there's a greater spiritual malice to be dealt with. It seemed the time when the Apostle Paul was there, he spared no effort to preach holiness in the lives of God's people. And in his absence, the spiritual vigilance that comes through the consistent preaching and teaching of God's word seemed to have weakened, isn't it? So when we come to church, we listen to the word of God, it is not to tickle our ears so that we would feel good, feel comforted when we make our way home, but it is to arouse us 
to know the, our spiritual state so that we may be aware of what is going on in our life, that where we have fallen short, the Word of God may be used to admonish us, to reprimand us, so that when we are reprimanded, we may learn, we may repent. So the Apostle Paul says that the Word of God is given to us so that we may realize where we have gone wrong and that we may take the step to correct ourselves and having corrected ourselves, that we may do the right thing. And so here is given to us God's way by which purity is preserved in his body. Fornication and pride, it comes together. As we were mentioning concerning the aggressive nature of, uh, of the fallen man, we realize that this is uh, true and very true and it's manifesting itself in our society today. And if we were not deal with it, if we would think that it is all right, parents, it is all right, let this go on in the society, men with men, women with women. Dear friends, I say to you that it is not all right. And it, is, it will lead to the destruction of the society. And the people of God must realize that. And so that they would stand to explain, to be sought and light. And all the more, the gospel is urgent, isn't it? How do you cause a person to change a deep rooted, deep seated, depraved nature. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can overcome, overturn, can thwart, can destroy the nature of sin that is in men. And so we have indeed a very urgent work, a very urgent task so that the work of the gospel must continue. And if, if in the church itself, the people of God are not exercising, uh, restrained, living the life that is pleasing in the sight of God, then how can there be a witness for the people of God? the people of God would indeed be a stumbling, isn't it? And therefore, the matter is urgent. The situation is grave. And the people of God must realize and that means that we have to deal with sin, with our own sin. And I pray that the Lord would cause His people to take time to examine themselves so that where we have fallen short, may the Lord help us to repent and to come back to Him. May the Lord's uh, grace strengthen us for His own mercy's sake. Help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy holy word. Strengthen thy people and grant us peace and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And send us forth to be thy witnesses this new week. This I ask and pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.